Jeff Leakey is, I, I would uh, say, if, uh, as close to a homegrown product as you can get. He started out here uh, at uh, Spring delivering pizza. Right, well, you worked in the pizza place, yeah. And I think he was uh, introduced or reintroduced to church here. Went through the school, the Spring Bible Institute, graduated there in 2001. Which seems like a long time ago. I guess, I guess for some it is, and some of us is not. He's the father of three daughters, Lorelai, Liliana, and, and Macario. And of course, his parents, Jeff and Joy Lickey, uh, not Jeff, Jean and Joy Lickey. <laughs> um, and I think, uh, Joy, you're, you're fixing the meal today, aren't you? Uh, and she does, she does an absolutely fantastic job and she certainly is a joy and I know she has great joy in the fact that her son <clears throat> will be speaking to us this morning. Jeff's done local preaching in Mexico and Texas and of course uh, he lives in the woodlands and he is a member here and we're <clears throat> very pleased to have him and very pleased to have him speak to us. He's going to speak on love your neighbor as yourself. He's going to speak to us. I'm thankful to be here, glad for the opportunity to speak on the lectures. I told Danny before I was glad that I was going before him. I'll be able to listen better to his for one thing, and uh, I love hearing Danny preach, so that's a good thing. Every year, David calls, and he asks ask me if I want to do a lecture, and I think, oh, do I really want to do that? I always say yes, and once I'm done with it, I'm glad that I did. I'm thankful to David for those invitations. My topic, love thy neighbor as thyself. I love my neighbors. I love my brethren. I love my enemies. I love my kids. I love pizza. Y'all laugh, but you automatically know that there's a difference in the way that I'm using love in all of those. Subtle differences on the first several, but the last one may be quite a bit different. You know, in some cultures, they love their neighbors, and they uphold that as a value. In other cultures, they eat them. You know, it's a matter of perspective and culture in that way. I always wonder if you're in a cannibalistic culture, and you're one of the kids there, and you ask your parents, what are we having for dinner tonight? And they say, neighbor. You hear the little kids say, I love neighbor. I don't think that really qualifies as loving your neighbor, but it is what it is. Well, what this really illustrates is the necessity of having a proper view of love, of understanding what it means biblically to love. Those are kind of extreme, they're kind of funny, but we understand that when we use the term love and we're talking about love, it can mean different things, and we need to have the, the biblical perspective <laughs> in this regard in order to be right with God. Knowing the difference, for instance, in the one before, is the difference in inviting your neighbors over for dinner and inviting your neighbors over for dinner. <laughs> so those subtleties can make big differences. I'd like you to look with me at Matthew chapter 22. That's going to be our text for starters. Matthew 22, beginning in verse 34. When the Pharisees had heard that he put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets kind of file away that last verse in your mind as we're going to come back to in a little bit but I look at these two commandments and the way that they're used here and I start to look around and I realize that getting these two commandments out of order in the wrong place is a source of religious error in the world today some people they try to put the second commandment first this is at least in part 
the root of the social gospel. As if somehow being kind to a fellow man discharges all of your obligations towards God. And that's simply not the case. They're putting the second commandment before the first. Other people have said, well, I put the first commandment in place, which you actually can't without having the second commandment, the same the other way, but having the first commandment in place in their mind absolves them of any responsibility towards other human beings. And that's not the case either. So having these two commandments and following them in their proper place is essential to fulfilling the biblical command to love in both regards. You know, things can get a little bit cluttered. As you start thinking about what it is to love, I look at 1 Thessalonians 4 and 9, and, you know, it's written there, he doesn't have any need to write to them. We understand at least some basics about love. You know love when you see it, and sometimes things get distorted when you try to put it into practice, and people without all of the Bible teaching on it, they get things out of whack. It's kind of like the other day I walked out of my house. My neighbor had left his donut on top of his car. And I recalled how a few days earlier he was telling me about how he's trying to lose weight. And I thought, well, you know, the proper thing to do would be to relieve him of that donut. Well, the Bible has more to say about it than just thinking about what it was that I could do for him and, and taking his donut because that would violate other commandments in the Scripture. And so things can get distorted. Things can get perverted and out of order if we don't understand what the Bible teaches about how it is that we're supposed to love. That's important. Not just to love, but how it is that we're supposed to love. The second commandment, Matthew 22, empowers man to love his neighbors. You ever think about love thy neighbor as thyself? It's very accessible. You know, you can grow in that understanding. You can have fine-tuning, but it's very accessible. Anybody can understand to, to begin to do those things. Another thing is, is that a, a, it guides man in how to do it. And we'll talk more as we go on about that. And so we can have some fine-tuning. But regarding the improper standards of love and man's relationship to his neighbor, this thing has been distorted quite a bit. Matthew chapter 7, verse 12 says, Therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. See, that comes up again. This is the law and the prophets. There's a continuity throughout the New Testament about how these commandments work in, in, in the scheme of redemption. But sometimes people categorize these under different metals. You know this one. We call it the golden rule. You're familiar with it. And sometimes people have taken the improper standards that men have set up and, and categorized them similarly. For instance, you have what's sometimes called the iron rule. And basically, this is just one of uh, several that is not a love of God, it's not a love of a neighbor, it's a love of self, either before God or before a neighbor or apart from that. The iron rule, which basically says, whatsoever ye would that men should not do unto you, even so do ye unto them. Some people live by that. I've heard variations on it, do unto others before they do unto you. That's frightening, but some people live by that standard and they, they practice it and this is much like the robbers in Luke, in Luke chapter 10 and verse 30, where they robbed the man on the road um, coming down from Jerusalem. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 11 through 13, John writes, For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. Wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. You know, Cain was a wicked man, and Cain slew his brother. He was practicing and living by the iron rule in this instance. I find a good occasion of this, not good, but uh, uh, an apt um, illustration of this in 1 Kings chapter 21. You have Ahab, and he sets his sight on Naboth's vineyard. And Jezebel is really the one who causes all the trouble there, but Ahab goes to Naboth and... Uh, he says, give me your vineyard, and he offers to pay him for it, and he refuses to sell it to him, and he kind of goes and pouts in the corner like a little baby. <laughs> and his wife looks at him and says, you know, what are you upset about? And so they go through the motions, and she says, well, you're the king. Get up and quit moping around. And so she sets things in order to have, uh, have this man killed and to take away the vineyard. These things happen, and they get up, and everybody's happy. Well, this is a practice of that iron, that iron rule that we're reading, that we're talking about. This is a corruption of what 
the golden rule is in, in the way that we're supposed to relate to other people created in God's image. The iron rule is a love of self above all other things. It's might makes right. Well, the iron rule obviously is not what God has in mind that we're supposed to follow. Another one is the brass rule. People have characterized this, and it basically says, Whatsoever men do unto you, even so do ye also unto them. In other words, it's like this. I don't want to hurt you, but if you start it, then we're going to have a problem. You know, it's uh, that sort of, I'm going to do to you exactly how you do to me, and there's no leveling effect, and, and people tend to go to the lowest common denominator living by this rule, but a lot of people actually live by it. They don't call it the bronze rule. They don't have a creed book of bronze rule guidelines that they go to, but people have this idea in their mind about how it is that they're supposed to relate to the world as they live their day-to-day -day life. And the bronze rule is one way that people do that. And so they do what, uh, treat people the way that they're treated. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 38. Jesus says, You have heard that it has been said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for the tooth. But I say unto you, that you resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law, and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whatsoever shall compel thee... Uh, Whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with them twain. I like going through the Sermon on the Mount and noticing the fact that he says you've heard this, which is different from a lot of Old Testament uh, quotations where it says it's written. You know, a lot of times people read this, you know, when they get on their calendar in January and they say, I'm going to read the Bible this year, and they start in Matthew. Uh, they get through this, and that's all the Bible they know. And they say, well, the Old Testament taught this, and they're going line by line down uh, those items in the Sermon on the Mount, they're saying, well, the Old Testament taught this. Well, the way that Jesus is addressing it are not necessarily the things that the Old Testament taught. He's addressing the corruption of the Pharisees of the Old Testament. The Old Testament taught the truth, and it was consistent. Well, uh, verse 42, Matthew 5, Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. Ye have heard of them and said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. The Old Testament didn't say that. The Old Testament didn't teach them that uh, the way that they taught it. Verse 44, But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth the rain on the just and the unjust. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans do so? Be therefore perfect as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. That's another thing to remember. Look at the perfection in that last part of that passage there. The go the second mile is above and beyond the way that other people treat you. To take when it, you're being wronged and to, in, to react to that with kindness. I'm sorry, I had an alarm on there. Um, I set my stopwatch. But to react with kindness when somebody is cruel towards you, that that's, uh, has a different effect. That's not according to the bronze rule. You know, you think about him saying that they're no better than the publicans. I always think about when I watch movies and they have mobsters, you know, these guys go out and do mobsterish stuff and they come home and kiss their kids goodnight. You know, what is it that people think that evil people are and how they, and how they are? Even these people have a sense of kindness in them and things that they love and have affection for. So the bronze rule falls short of the biblical standard. The other one is the silver rule, and this is basically this. This is basically like the pacifist idea. Whatsoever you would not that men should do unto you, even so do you not unto them. What's yours is yours, and what's mine is mine. That's the, that's the attitude that people have. In other words, you know, I'm just going to go through life, and I'm not going to do things to people that I don't want done to me. There's a problem with that, is that it's based in the negative. It's not actually going out and actively pursuing good works. That's contrasted with the golden rule that you read about in your Bible. In James chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, and on through James 2, 14 through 26, we have a, a, a faith that's active and living. And that's different from this pacifist uh, idea. Do no harm is the way that people live their lives. It's become popular to delve into Eastern religions and Buddhism, and people think they have an understanding of what it is, and 
probably they have a very limited idea. It's interesting to look back and see how it made its inroads into Western culture. And you look at especially people like in the Beatles, and they came out with the songs and, and quoted all these things. In fact, Paul McCartney wrote one, Live and Let Die. You hear that, and it's kind of funny, it's kind of sad. You have to understand what he means by that. That's really living the silver rule. Their passive is not a kindness. It's an apathy. The way that they're pacifist is not a kindness, it's an apathy. In fact, it actually gets worse than that. If you go and you read through their, their books, and like the Bhagavad Gita, there was one particular warrior who was upset because he was going to have to go out to war against his brethren, and, and the Krishna came down and told him, you're just playing your part. It's just the physical is just an illusion. You go out there and slaughter them. You're all just actors in a play. And so you do your part and let them die because that's their part. And so he was happy about that, and he went off and slaughtered multitudes. Brethren, that's the way that a lot of people actually have twisted that even further uh, in the silver rule. But when you get past, when you go beyond God's standard, there is no end to the evil and wickedness that you'll commit and rationalize in any number of ways. The golden rule is the standard. I thought of another one that I hadn't seen before, and I thought of it when I was reading a book. I was got involved in a... a um, community group that's loosely associated with what I do at work and uh, one of the things that we do is we have to read one of these self-help books. Now I see a few of you are starting to gag a little bit because you understand what that means. They're all pretty much the same. There's a little bit of common sense mixed up with sort of a give where you can get away with doing whatever you want to do and pass it off as what the book told you to do in some way. It's a bunch of nonsense. But anyways in this book he says that there is the golden rule, and then there's the platinum rule, which is higher. And what he says is this. The platinum rule is that you treat others how they want to be treated. Well, I thought about that. I knew that it was wrong because I read my Bible. And I thought about what it really meant and what was going on there, and I came up with a different name for it, and it's not the platinum rule. My dad's a geologist, and when we were kids, he made us memorize all these minerals, and I remembered one or two of them. One of them is pyrite. We call that fool's gold. That's the, you know, that's the common name for it, fool's gold. And so I call this the pyrite rule. You know, when somebody, when you're treating somebody just the way that they want to be treated, they might not be treated the way that God wants them to be treated. And that's a pretty significant problem. The fool's gold rule comes in two different forms. For instance, it comes in that one when you're simply treating people how they want to be treated. Another one is if I treat people the way that I want to be treated but I'm a fool, then that's also another form of the fool's gold rule. Let me give you an illustration of what I mean. If I don't want to be bothered with hearing the gospel, then guess what I'm not going to do? I'm not going to preach the gospel if I'm living by that rule. I don't want people telling me, and so I'm not going to tell anybody else. You know, I've heard brethren say that very thing. I don't want people coming and telling me about things, so I don't tell anybody else. Well, that's the fool's gold rule. They're fools. The Bible has a great deal to say about fools, like, for instance, Psalm 14 and verse 1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. This passage obviously applies to the atheist who says there is no God, but that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the person who lives and acts within his heart as if there is no God. It doesn't matter what he says with his lips. Well, that man's a fool. And he's living as a fool, and he's treating others like a fool, living according to the fool's gold rule. Psalm 94, verses 9 through 11. The Lord shall not see, neither shall the God of Jacob regard it. Understand, ye brutish among the people, and ye fools, when will ye be wise? He that planted the ear, shall he not hear? He that formed the eye, shall he not see? He that chastiseth the heathen, shall he not correct? He that teacheth man knowledge, shall it not he know? You know, in this passage... You suspect that some of these fools aren't going to like how God's treating them. Well, that's because they're fools. They're not going to appreciate the good things that God is extending towards them, and they're not going to like it when they're receiving the consequences of their foolishness. Proverbs 12 and verse 15, The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. The fool says, I don't want to be afflicted in any way. And so if I have information that I know is going to cause somebody else trouble, it would be the right thing to do to just tell a little white lie. 
That's the fool's gold rule at work. Now, on the most basic level, that's the fool's gold, uh, fool's, rule, fool's gold rule at work. Little white lies. Well, that's the fool is right in his own eyes. He doesn't see anything wrong with that. But he that hearkeneth to counsel is wise. And something else we get from this is that proper love has to be learned. I said it's accessible, and it is. It gives you a starting place. But to love properly and to grow in love and have the kind of love that the Bible tells us we must have, that's something that has to be learned. Well, what is proper love? You can go through and you can find all kinds of definitions on love. If you go to Google and you type in definition of love, you're going to read all kinds of stuff. You can go to dictionaries. You can find sermons on this where they've gone through and taken Bible passages on love and they've built something. But you can boil it all down, the truth down, to basically a couple simple propositions. But love defined as this. It's the highest regard for the ultimate well-being of another at the expense of self. It's the highest regard for the ultimate well-being of another at the expense of self. That's real love. You go through your Bible, and we're going to look at a few things to see how this comes full circle in understanding the first, second, the first commandment and the second commandment and what it has to do with loving our neighbor. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, of course, this is the passage where we get that first commandment, but Deuteronomy chapter 6, first five verses. Now these are the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you. It's interesting, you think about a, few, uh, a fool listening to this, sitting there. We're going to talk about commandments and statutes and judgments again. I don't want to hear that. That's the way the fool would regard that. He said, which the Lord your God commanded to teach you, that ye might do them. In other words, these aren't just decorations for your house, you know. These are things that you're actually supposed to do. So he tells them that they're supposed to do them. In the land whither you go to possess it, that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. Note that. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well... I have a snooze on my alarm. It's the most awful thing, and I forgot to turn it off from last Saturday. I'm going to give this to this brother right here and see if he can figure out how to turn it off. <laughs> Eric will get it. So if you have an alarm set for Saturday, turn it off before you get up. Anyways, Deuteronomy chapter 6, keeping the commandments... In other words, let's get right down to it here. He's going to go through and he's going to tell them that your well-being is predicated on doing what God said to do. Physical Israel, over there in the land, they had a stake in that land, but it was based on them doing what God said to do. If they did what God said to do, God was going to bless them in the land. If they did not do what God said to do, well, it wasn't going to go so well. That's what Deuteronomy chapter 6 is teaching. And you get down to verse 5, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Drop down to verse 17, You shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies and his statutes, which he hath commanded thee. And thou shalt do that which is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest go in and possess the good land which the Lord sware unto thy fathers. Verse 25, And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. The ultimate well-being, is what I said, was an essential component of love. Not just the general welfare, the ultimate well-being. If I'm hungry, somebody can give me a cup of soup, I'm happy for a day. If I'm lost in sin, that cup of soup only goes so far. It gets me by a few hours, maybe. It depends on what kind of soup it is. But The ultimate well-being. God used these physical things with Israel to illustrate spiritual principles, that our well-being is related to whether or not we obey God. Isaiah chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. The show of their countenance doth witness against them, and they declare their sin as Sodom. They hide it not. Woe unto their soul, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves. Say ye to the righteous, then it shall be well with him, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. The righteous, it's going to be okay with them. Those unrighteous, they're receiving wrath. It's basically as simple as that. Well, you go on in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 13 and 14. You're familiar with this. And Solomon, in fact, deals with the idea of the ultimate 
versus what happens here on this earth in, in chapters 8 and 9. But he says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of men. Now, the question, why? What does it matter? He says, for God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. You go forward to the New Testament, somebody's looking at this, and they have their weird ideas about how the Old Testament relates to the New, and they say, well, that's not the New Testament. New Testament, you don't have to do anything. That's not true. Romans chapter 2, beginning in verse 3. You know, Paul writes chapter 1, and he talks about those Gentiles, they're wicked, okay. Uh, then he gets to chapter 2, and he says, you Jews, y'all are wicked too. And they say, no way. But nonetheless, Paul writes anyways. He says, Thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee, thee to repentance? Watch it. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up wrath uh, unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. You're living wickedly, there's something to come. You're going to pay for the wickedness that you do. That's what he's saying there. You go on and you see his references to glory in verse 7, verse 8. But to them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation, and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. For there is no respect of persons with God. Look, i got to slip that in there on a sermon on loving your neighbor somewhere. No respect of persons with God. It doesn't matter who you are. This is how it is. Here's what we're getting at, is that our ultimate well-being is inextricably linked to our obedience to God. My well-being, my ultimate well-being is linked to my obedience to God. There's no way around that. That means that if you love me and you're concerned about my ultimate well-being, then you're concerned about my obedience to God. If I love you and I'm concerned about your ultimate well-being, then I'm concerned about your obedience to God. That boils down love in a very practical way, understanding the deep things of the Bible. Look with me, if you will, at John chapter 14 and verse 15. Because, brethren, it can't get any simpler than this. If you love me, keep my commandments. Somebody says, I love God, and they don't keep his commandments. They're a liar, and the truth is not in him. You go on down in verse 24 of John chapter 14. If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him. And he will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which he hears is not mine, but the Father which, which sent me. How am I supposed to love others with all this understood? John takes it the next step in 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. He says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this. Okay, that sounds like a signpost. Here's how it works. And I like that. If I'm reading instruction manuals, if I'm going down the road trying to get somewhere, I like a sign that says, here it is. I like those signs, those blue signs with all the restaurants on them. If you're looking for a restaurant, this is how you know where it is. There's a sign right there. And it's kind of like that with this. Here's how you can know if what's right is right and if you're loving as you're supposed to. He says, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. For whosoever is born of God overcometh the world and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? You catch that? Again, that's our well-being. You want victory over the struggles of this world? You want to have that victory by faith? Well, it comes down to believing in God, trusting him, and carrying out his word in your life. That's how you tend to your ultimate well-being. That's how you show concern for others' ultimate well-being. And it starts with us personally obeying the will of God. That is the greatest way that I can demonstrate my love for another person on this earth is by me, myself, obeying what God says. There's no other way. That's the first thing. Well, somebody might say, okay, but I understand what you're saying about all this stuff about obedience and love. What does this have to do with us loving God? Because the first commandment is first. You have to understand that. It's fairly simple. In John chapter 17 and verse 4, Jesus said, I've glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. You know, 
we glorify God with our salvation, with our obedience. Actually, God is glorified in our salvation, if I could put it that way to be a little bit uh, more precise. God is glorified by our salvation. Jesus said, I did the work, it brought you glory. It's the same thing with us. If you love God, if you want to bring him glory, here's what the Bible says on how to do it, is to do his will, to have that everlasting life, which he has promised and offered us by his plan. Somebody gets a little bit smart, and they come up with questions. They know what love is. They know when they love the people they want to love, and they say things like, well, who is my neighbor? You know where I'm going with this. Luke chapter 10 has for us the account of the Good Samaritan. And I'd like you to start turning there. And we're going to look at that in just a second. But let me start out by saying, first off, my enemy is my neighbor. I already read you the passage in Matthew chapter 5, which showed us that very clearly. Uh, verses 43 on down through 48, that my enemy is my neighbor. I have to love my enemy. It may not be on the top of my list of things that I want to do, but I can understand it. I can grow my appreciation of God's command to do that, and I can actually do it because God's commandments are not grievous. My enemy is my neighbor, and I am commanded to love him. The Old Testament taught this as I made reference to Leviticus 19 and verse 18. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. You have similar statements uh, repeated in Deuteronomy 22, and then very specific in Exodus chapter 23, verses 4 and 5. But sometimes people might have read that, at least living under the Old Testament. They said, oh, see, he says, thy people. So I don't have to love those people. I just have to love my people, these people. Well, that's not exactly what was meant in that Old Testament passage. And there are plenty of other Old Testament passages which would clear that up for them. Exodus 23, verses 4 and 5, If thou meet thine enemy's ox or his ass going astray, thou shalt surely bring it back to him again. If thou see the ass of him that hateth thee lying under his burden, wouldst forbear to help him, thou shalt surely help with him. If I see my enemy's animals going astray, I don't look at it and say, Oh, well, it's his. I don't have to deal with it. That's not loving my enemy. That's not loving my neighbor. My enemy is my neighbor, and I'm commanded to love him. When I think about this, I'm reminded of uh, what happened back there in the book of Jonah. Think about God told Jonah to go and preach to Nineveh. He didn't want to. Those were his enemies. He didn't like them. And so he thought that they should be destroyed by God. And he tries to run away, and eventually God gets him there. He goes through the city. He preaches, and he goes back up on the hill to watch it rain down fire and brimstone or whatever he thought was going to happen. And the people repented. And Jonah gets a little bit upset about that, and... I always think it's funny that it's referred to as a prayer in Jonah chapter 4 and verse 2 because you just don't think of this kind of uh, uh, discourse towards God actually being a prayer. But nonetheless, that's what it's called and that's what he says. And he said, I knew that they had repent. I knew that you'd forgive them because you're a good God. And he's mad about that. God inquires of him about that a little bit. And then Jonah goes and sits and pouts and Ends up, a gourd comes up for shade over him, and then the sun comes up and dries out. He loses gourd. He weeps over the gourd, and, uh, you know, God asked him about him being upset about that gourd. He didn't do anything to build that gourd. And God points out that how can he be so upset about his shade tree, and he's not upset about those multitudes of people down there in Nineveh who would have died if they hadn't repented? Well, his enemy was his neighbor, and he should have understood that. The Good Samaritan was a neighbor. Follow that very closely. You know, I've had discussions with people, and they actually thought that the man who was beaten and thrown on the side of the road was the one who was the Samaritan. And that's not what it is. The Good Samaritan was the one who was the neighbor. You know, we think, well, if I'm supposed to help my neighbor, then the one who's the victim is the neighbor. And that's not what's going on here. The Lord turns that around, but you look at Luke chapter 10. Beginning in verse 25, Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. That, that sounds kind of familiar. He said unto him, Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. In other words, he already knew the answer. Just do it pretty simple but this lawyer couldn't leave it at that he had to justify himself 
And so he asked the question, who is my neighbor? And this kind of reminds me of Pilate, what is truth? You know, uh, nobody can really figure this stuff out, blah, blah, blah. But nonetheless, the answer was there. He could have understood it if he wanted it to. One time I had a conversation with an elder in the Lord's Church talking about stopping mouths and false teachers and things like that. And he said, how in the world are you going to do that? I said, well, you know, the luxury of me not being an elder is I don't actually have to answer that question to be qualified to be an elder. And so it is sort of like that with this lawyer. He's a student of the law, and he's going to ask a question like, who is my neighbor? You know, let's see if we can find somebody uh, who actually understands that. Who can we get? Surely we're going to have to go to the universities to find somebody to answer this sophisticated question. Wait, I got an idea. Let's look at the life of a simple Samaritan. Maybe he'll know. You know, what's really going on here, who is my neighbor is not one who I'm supposed to help necessarily in this passage. What he's saying is, if you're going to be a neighbor, you're not going to have a problem. And that's what the Samaritan was doing in his life. He didn't need to ask the lawyer, who is my neighbor, before he went and helped that man. He didn't have to ask anybody about that. He saw the man in need and he helped him. That's what made him the neighbor. And this lawyer was ignorant and unqualified to answer that question. You see the account there where he told the story of the man going down from Jerusalem. And I always wonder about that, leaving him half dead. You know, what does that look like? Is that kind of like mostly dead? Well, you know, maybe the priest and the Levite had decided, well, I don't want to be ceremonial and clean or something like that, so I'll leave him alone. Or maybe they had thought, well, maybe there's bandits hiding and I don't want to get hurt. Well, that doesn't really qualify as love if you're thinking that either. You know, and you look at the fact that the priest came first, and then the Levite, and somebody who was hearing this may have said, well, you know, the, the priest was important. He couldn't take time to help that man. And, well, then the Levite comes and goes past him, and that's another story. But finally, a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I'll repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was the neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, He that showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said unto him, Go and do thou likewise. You know, the Samaritan didn't have any problem understanding who his neighbor was, and he didn't have any problem understanding what it meant to be a neighbor. It basically boils down to a few basic things. That Samaritan had compassion. And when that compassion kicked in, he didn't have to get into detail and a full study uh, of exactly what it was that you're supposed to do. Uh, I guess it was Jenny and I were having a discussion about Bill Cosby the other day. And it, there was this one Bill Cosby where he was talking about where he and his wife were having a baby. And he said, now we're intellectuals. That means you go to school for things that other people do naturally. So they went to school to find out all the stuff that was involved in having a baby. That's the way that some people approach things like this with compassion. Can you grow in it? Absolutely. Can you fine-tune it? Sure you can. Can you do it better? Absolutely. But you understand that you can love your neighbor. If you're a child of God, no matter where you are starting out, you can love your neighbor. And it's not difficult to do. You don't need 15,000 recipes for casserole to accomplish it. You just find somebody, have compassion on them, find a need that they have, and fulfill that need. A real need, by the way. You know, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5 boils it down for us in a very sublime way. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You know the rest of the passage. Jesus Christ came to this earth. He had compassion on us. He didn't have to. We weren't deserving of it. He offered that salvation by his grace. He went to the cross. He died on the cross for our sins by his compassion. If I take myself out of the equation and I have compassion on others, loving my neighbor as myself is not going to be that difficult of a task in order to understand and to do. Thank you.